My text is taken from the Epistle to the Hebrews, from chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore let us also, seeing we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. The year 1948 will be forever famous in the world of sport because it was the year of the 14th Olympiad in the new style. It was the old Olympiad or some similar contest that the author of this epistle had in mind when he used the words I have taken for the text. The Christian life, he says, is a race. We are surrounded by a great crowd of spectators. We are to cast aside all the clinging folds of sin, and we are to run with steadiness, looking unto Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Now I want us to realize, if we can, just how vivid a picture this is of the Christian life. Observe first, it is a race and not a picnic. It is a contest, not a siesta in the sun. There is an awful earnestness about it. The most important things in time and eternity hang upon the issue of this race. There are times, in youth perhaps, when we dash at it with the all-out effort of the sprinter. There are times, grim going of a long and grueling race. The last bit of the contest may find us barely able to make the end and tempted to feel that we have reached the finish before the tape is round our breast. On occasion there are obstacles to overleap and difficult corners to manoeuvre. Sometimes we seem to be running in a great arena but other days find us plugging along life's normal highways and byways. But it is a race all the time in youth and age, sprinting on the track or steadily coasting across the open country, slipping away at the start with eagerness or staggering to the finish. It is a race. Always it is a race. The first question, therefore, I have to ask of any one of you is this. Are you in this race? Can I salute you with the respect that belongs to any people who enter a contest and mean to win. Now in the second place, our writer says that we are surrounded by a crowd of spectators. He calls them a cloud of witnesses. The benches are black with people. There is a multitude looking on. Let us look a little more closely at the composition of this crowd. The king is here. Little children are here. Notice their intense faces. Children learn more by what they see than by what we say. Example is still more eloquent than advice. One good way to prevent juvenile delinquency is to run the Christian race yourself with a strict respect to the rules. Observe that this is no passive crowd. They are following everything with intense interest. Every step is being watched. No effort is overlooked. At times they cannot keep their seats. They rise and shout their approval of every gallant runner down below. This is more than a pastime on a summer afternoon. There is an inwardness to this contest, and the spectators know it. But the author of our letter has a most particular interest in certain of the spectators. Those are the competitors of other days. Nobody is watching the race with more sympathy, with more longing, with more intense understanding than those who in previous Olympiads had run and won the prize. Some of them are on the benches of the spectators. Some of them are on the track side waiting by the tape. Some of them are taking time on the new contestants. Some actually help the competitors on their grueling way. Look, they are splashing water on their faces and thrusting a cooling drink into their hands. And with the drink, I have no doubt, goes also an enheartening word. 
These are the witnesses our author has most in mind when he urges us to remember our spectators in this great contest. These are the cloud of witnesses he would remind us of. It is their help and inspiration that he promises to us as we run. He says, in effect, you will not be running in a vacuum. All the time you will be watched. You will be understood. You will be sympathized with. Run, therefore, with that knowledge in mind. Let me ask you, my friends, another question. If you are still hesitating, why hesitate any longer? Enter the contest, enter now with these inducements before you, with the promise of this spiritual aid. I beg you, enter and run well. What must you do first, you might well ask, if you are to enter this race. You must first strip for it. Competitors and spectators don't dress alike. One can wear normal attire if it is just a ceremonial parade. Indeed, one may have a slow and formal march with banners and wear the same uniform as one's friends. But when the contest is on, away with all those encumbrances. Strip yourself of every clinging fold. The moment has come to be at the starting point. One unnecessary garment may make all the difference now. And that, says our author, is how we are to deal with sin. We are to strip its clinging folds away. For a Christian to run in this race encumbered by sin is like an athlete in a stern contest with an overcoat on. It's like entering a race swathed up in breeches and putties when you are to be running in shorts. Away with it, therefore. Everything that endangers you in this contest, strip it off and hurtle your body as clean and clear as you can down that course and, and win the race. And where are you to look as you run? Some men look back as they run to see how near the next competitor is, or if anyone has fallen out of the race. That is a foolish thing to do. They think it may save them an effort, but it, it often costs them the race. Look ahead. Look to Jesus. Run towards him with confidence. The trumpets may sound for you. He is waiting to welcome anyone who will run towards him in that faith. Run on. But if you do not see him for a while, and that can happen to any one of us, if the mists intervene and you do not see his face, catch a glimpse of those outstanding witnesses who watch you from the track side with love and longing. Catch a glimpse from them and, and still run on. Think of St. Francis of Assisi. How lightly he held the world, and because he was ready to lay it down, he got more from it than those who cling so passionately to earth. And here is St. Joan. Let us honor a brave woman who believed in the guidance of God and obeyed even at the cost of her own life. God still speaks to men and women. He would speak to you if you listened and learn to distinguish his voice from the murmurs of self-will. And here is John Bunyan. Some people feel superior to John Bunyan because he earned his living at one time as a tinker. God uses whom he will. God used John Bunyan and spoke through him and his books to millions. And here is Wesley. He belongs also to the trackside witnesses who urge us on in our own contest. No man ever did a better day's work for England than John Wesley, said one historian. Wesley is remembered most for his tireless preaching and his genius for organization, but he was a saint and a scholar behind it all. He made tens of thousands of pounds and gave it all away to the poor. Nor must Robert Rakes be overlooked. 
For many years, young children toiled in mines and mills and factories, but grew up hopelessly illiterate. And this angered and distressed the soul of Robert Rakes. In 1780, he started in the city of Gloucester, a Sunday school, to teach children to read and to teach them the Christian faith. You have taught the children to read and write in England, he says, but you have not yet taught them to live like Jesus Christ. Sunday schools have now spread all over the world. On with the work. And here is David Livingstone. Many men have served Africa well, but none more than David Livingstone. He did not go to get, he went to give. All his years he was giving, finally he gave himself. No one can deny that he ran his race well. His spirit beckons us along the heavenly way. Do you recognize this striking face? This is William Booth who founded the Salvation Army. He was God's soldier. Saints are strong and brave. Always, always they have courage. He loved God, did Booth, but he hated the devil more. And urged all his soldiers to do the same. He sends at the track side and urges us on. We are compassed about by a great cloud of witnesses, a multitude that no man can number. Run then, snatching encouragement from these at the track side, but looking way to Jesus, the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith.